Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our second session of Mini Med School. We're so excited to have you all back. So thank you for being here. My name is Summer Connery, and I work for the Department of Graduate Medical Education at UCSF Fresno, which again, the fun reminder is the largest physician training program between Sacramento and Los Angeles. Um, yeah, we're excited about this six part series. This is session two. If you happen to miss session one, we will go ahead and put a link to the YouTube video in the chat. So please find it there if you would like to rewatch it or if you would like to share it with someone. It's public, so we're more than happy to share the info. Uh, we love that. So um, yeah, without further ado, let me get back into introducing Dr. Dylan. So Dr. Suki Dillon, we love her in case you missed it last week. Wanted to give you a little info about her. Dr. Dillon is a Fresno native. She went to Fresno State for her undergraduate education and then earned her medical degree at Chicago Medical School and completed her emergency medicine residency training here at UCSF Fresno. Hooray. Uh, she currently works as an emergency medicine faculty at UCSF Fresno and has been working with the Department of Public Health since February to contribute to various guidelines and protocols in response to COVID-19 in Fresno County. She's passionate about community and outreach and education, which is kind of why she's the perfect program director for Mini Med School. So thanks, Dr. Dolan, take it away. Thank you, Summer, thank you. You always make me blush. Uh, this is gonna go on for six weeks, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, what? it's gonna get we crazier every happen. week. We can't we couldn't have gotten this done without Summer. Summer is the main person behind all of this. She keeps me on my toes at all times and make sure things happen on time. So thank you, Summer. We really appreciate it. Got it. Um, so what we're going to do is, before I introduce Dr. Spano, who's going to be our first speaker, we're going to do some icebreaking questions, like icebreaker questions like we did last time, just to make it fun. So I'm going to share my screen, and we'll do a couple, couple of those, and then we'll go from there. So... I'm gonna make this the main thing. And then remember, you can go to polleb.com um, and slash Sukjit Dillon 050, or you can uh, just text Sukjit Dill 050 to 22333 to answer these questions. So tell me about the last great TV show or movie you've watched. Good doctor. I actually watched that a while ago too. Dynasty, I, I've seen that one. I've not seen some of these. Oh, Criminal Minds, love that show. <laughs> I like it, come on, all right. There's some here that I've never even heard of, so I'm gonna to have to check those out. We do save these responses at the end, so we can go through them. <laughs> I love it, awesome. Lots of different variety. I do see quite a bit criminal shows or, um, so that's pretty nice. That's what I like, so. Okay, nice. Now we're gonna move on to the next one. Give me one second. And then we'll do this one. Where do you wanna go once we're out of this pandemic? <laughs> and then Dr. Spano will tell us a little bit about flying <laughs> and emergencies while flying. <laughs> I like it. Oh, school, college, I love it. Mexico, beach, I'll take any beach. London, Scotland, awesome. Yeah, I don't know where I wanna go. I was supposed to go to India. I would love to go back to India if I can sometime soon. <laughs> I like it. Everywhere, perfect. <laughs> Anywhere. <laughs> Awesome guys, those are awesome. All right, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. I'm gonna get back to Zoom. 
and I'm gonna introduce Dr. Spano. Thank you for sharing your responses, guys. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Spano. Uh, she is actually a local from Fresno. So she's a Fresno, which is awesome. Uh, and she's not left Fresno, which is even better. Uh, so she received her MD at Temple University in Philadelphia um, before emergency medicine training. And then she came uh, here for her wilderness medicine fellowship at UCSF Fresno. Um, and she decided to stick around with us, which is awesome. Uh, she's actually the director of the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship at this point here at UCSF Fresno, so that's pretty great. She's actually an active member of the search and rescue team uh, that serves the Fresno County, so she has great stories to tell, and the adjacent national park. So as you know, we have multiple at least three different national parks around us. Um, and she has been part of those, so that's pretty amazing. Um, her hobbies include long distance backpacking, and she didn't tell me about her marathon running or running, but she runs quite a bit too. And she's actually uh, hiked PCT trail, about 1,000 miles of it, which is amazing. It's what, 2,000, Dr. Spano? About 2,000 miles? Halfway there, that's so great. Uh, well, I will let you take over, Dr. Spano, um, and let you get started with your talk. Suki, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's really quite a privilege to get to speak to the Mini Med School. Um, I just find that there's a lot of connections that are made from uh, these programs that are unexpected and really add a lot uh, to kind of our daily life. Um, so I don't know how that's gonna work virtually, but um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, like all of the presenters, uh, my, my email is online under the UCSF Fresno emergency medicine department link. Um, just click on my name and it's there. So if you have questions or follow up, I'd be happy to connect with you. Uh, it is odd during COVID to give you a talk about flying somewhere. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that we it's about dreams and the future and the future is near. Um, and so this call this talk is called on call at 30,000 feet. Um, and I want to start the talk with a safety announcement uh, before we get started. First, please make sure that your seatbelt is securely fastened. Seatbelts can be purchased for $5. <laughs> to fasten, insert the metal fitting into the buckle and tighten the buckle by pulling the loose end away from you. To release, purchase a release flap for $7. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. We've never paid for seatbelts before. With a rapid change in cabin pressure, oxygen masks will automatically drop from the compartment above your seat, free of charge. Place the mask over your nose and mouth, and to start the flow of oxygen, pay your flight attendant $75.63. As always, exact change is appreciated. Now I know that some of you are still concerned about getting there safely. Enjoy your flight. <laughs> so um, if uh, you didn't really like the safety video, I'd like you just to know as a precaution that there are a lot of uh, kind of cheeky videos in this talk uh, because they amuse me greatly and they're definitely relevant to the subject at hand. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about the objectives of today's talk. Um, first, I want to define the scope of the problem with airline emergencies uh, and really this is too early to touch on COVID and airlines, except that it's very, very clear um, that COVID can be transmissible on uh, in-flight uh, duration, uh, flights of, uh, of long duration for sure. Uh, and there's already been several case reports about that. But we're gonna really talk about the overall scope of medical emergencies because COVID, although it may kill you, isn't really a medical emergency when you get it on the plane. Um, we're going to get an anecdote from your experiences and also take a look at evidence-based medicine um, and publications on this. We're going to review the airplane environment um, and for conditions to watch out for at altitude. And we'll talk a little bit about economy class syndrome uh, and whether this is a myth or a fact. It's something a lot of people haven't heard about, um, and so it'd be a nice thing to touch upon. We'll talk about step-by-step -step how to handle an in-flight emergency and the medical legal issues that healthcare providers face when they do do uh, do respond on a plane. Uh, so the first question is really, is this going to happen to me? And I would really like to um, do a straw poll of of the group 
Um, if you can hit your raise hand button, if you've been on a plane when there's been a medical emergency, that would be great. Suki, how many folks do we have raising their hands there? Six attendees who have seven so far who have raised their hands. So are we, so if you can, the seven people who've raised their hands um, since we've identified you, I'd just like you to um, just in one word in your mind, think about what kind of the chief complaint was if you knew um, of the person that was having a medical emergency. I mean, if you were having a emerg medical emergency, um, then you probably would know what the chief complaint was. Um, and we're just gonna unmute you and have you share what the chief complaint was on your flight. All right, I'm just gonna go down the list. Oh no, your hands are going down, guys. <laughs> okay, Allie, I'm gonna unmute you. You're up. Okay, Allie, go ahead and tell us. Heart attack. Okay. Wow. And then, yep. I, uh -huh. I'm gonna unmute Alyssa. Um, so I actually don't know what the chief complaint was on my flight. No worries. That's okay. Because they don't announce it to everybody. So no worries. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then we have Kaylee. Um, hi. Uh, um, they lost sensation in their body. So I assume they had a stroke okay. on the way to Maui from San oh. Francisco. Oh, wow. Oh my god. Terrible. <laughs> terrible. Oh, and then now we have Paula. They were having a panic attack. So they were um, due to, I think it was an anxiety attack, but they were, so they were hyperventilating. That was the chief complaint. Awesome. I think those are all the hands that were still raised. Okay, if anyone was real shy, you can put your, your answer in the chat box. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, uh, I've probably been on at least three flights where they've called for a medical professional. Um, four, if you count, when I was a medical student and I was turned away as a medical student since I didn't have a license to practice, they would not let me talk to the patient. Um, and anybody with eyeballs, the patient was in the row in front of me, could tell the patient was having a stroke. Um, didn't really require medical school. They have these nice, you know, act fast campaigns for the face, arm, speech, you know, time. Uh, so I, I think anybody on the plane, like the other person sitting next to them could have diagnosed it, but uh, they, they would not let me as a medical student. Um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly common, uh, but it, there was a poll done in 1989, which is quite some time ago, and it was done by the New England Journal of Medicine, and they said that there was 54 incidents per million flights. And so that's really infrequent, which is odd since we already have like five or six out of 200 people saying uh, that it's happened to them. British Air did a study in the year 2000 and they found one incidence per 11,000 passengers. And that's a lot more similar to the kind of incidents that we're seeing in our group here today. And then New England Journal did another study in 2013 realizing that these studies are sort of out of date. And they show, showed there was one incidence in every 604 flights. And that's an interesting analogy because flights in 2013 are really, really different than flights were in 2000. Um, if anybody was flying back in the early 2000s, uh, the planes were pretty empty. It'd be kind of common that you wouldn't have people next to you. And by 2013, everybody has figured out that flying to fabulous destinations is the way to go. And, uh, and so planes are pretty packed. And so one for every 604 flights, it's maybe very similar incidents to one every 11,000 because there are so many more people on the plane. So there's some questions about when this happens, how often is there a physician on board? And it's estimated that 40 to 90% of the time there is a physician on the flight. And then the next question would be how many deaths occur a year due to in-flight medical emergencies? Um, now, this is going to be a statistic for U.S. deaths. If you're aware, some of the longest flights in the world um, go from the U.S. to Asia, and some of those airlines actually now have morgue compartments in the plane to put a deceased patient because the flights are so long. 
So in the US, there's about 20 to 100 passengers a year um, who will die on an aircraft. So now you know that there are about 40 to 90% of the time a physician on board or admits to being on board, how often do they actually assist? About half of the time. Um, and so it's kind of estimated that there are physicians who may not you know, practice primary patient assessment as part of their regular care, uh, like a radiologist uh, or a pathologist who may not be eager to respond to the emergency because they feel like they might not be well suited to do so. Um, and a little bit of this talk is sort of the role for those people, um, even though that's not their primary practice. And then there's a really important question, is there a legal duty to ask? And do you think that people are required to provide care on a plane? So if you're saying no, um, that's correct, that legally you're not required to act. Um, but I'd just like to quote Albert Einstein, those who have the privilege to know have a duty to act. And I think that there's an ethical obligation to society to try to do something. Um, and the list of excuses for why people don't want to do this is very long. Um, but I think it's mainly because people are afraid they're not gonna be able to provide uh, the right care. Um, and I don't think that that's a good enough reason to not be involved. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. So let's talk about an airline. So the average passenger airline um, that's flying at around 39,000 feet is pressurized to an altitude of 7,874 feet. Now this is a little bit old data. I went to the Boeing plant right before COVID um, of February this year because I really like airplanes and I thought it was really neat that you could go into a large warehouse where they're building the airplanes in front of you um, while you walk on catwalks. And the Dreamliners that they've been building for multiple airline companies actually are much more comfortable, they're quieter, they're lighter, they're more gas efficient, and people come off the plane feeling better. And one of the reasons that is, is that they are able to pressurize those planes to a lower elevation. Um, and so a Dreamliner, instead of being around 8,000 feet, is pressurized to around five to 6,000 feet. And that is a significant difference in how you feel and how puffy you are uh, when you get off the plane. So it's just kind of interesting to know the future of air travel is gonna look a little different in how comfortable you are. Well, what happens when you're around 8,000 feet? Um, a normal people with a pulse oximeter on their finger who go uh, to 8,000 feet in the mountains here in right outside of Fresno, um, will notice that their pulse ox will drop about three to 4%. Uh, and that's not very dramatic, um, but one of, one of the things as a physician you think about is when you notice a lower pulse ox, is you think about symptomatic hypoxia when there's low oxygen in the blood. Um, and we know very well what that looks like in the emergency department. Um, people come in in respiratory distress, they're working very hard to breathe, uh, they have retractions of the muscles in their chest and lungs. Sometimes it's in small children, their nose can flare, um, and they look very distraught. Uh, and we really correlate that to the oxygen saturation. Um, in just a few minutes, I'm going to show you what this looks like when you don't have underlying disease. That being said, there are some underlying conditions that this three to 4% drop in oxygen can have a clinical and symptomatic difference. So those with underlying chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or interstitial lung disease or pulmonary hypertension are gonna actually be affected by small changes like this, whereas you would feel normal. Uh, congenital or valvular heart disease, uh, severe, severe coronary artery disease that is not treated um, or uncompensated CHF will not tolerate this change in pulse ox well. Um, and also uh, people with sickle cell disease um, are sensitive to changes in oxygenation. It can create the sickling of those red blood cells and create a crisis. Um, and also those with obstructive sleep apnea, which is interesting because they overnight are dropping well into the 70s uh, and yet they're still alive. Uh, but they are very sensitive to changes in oxygenation inside of an airplane environment. So again, this, this shortness of breath at rest, coughing, anxiety, agitation, uh, blue cyanosis around the face or nail beds, tachycardia, rapid breathing or uh, crackly sounds in the lungs. This is what we see when we are at sea level. But I wanna show you what hypoxia looks like when someone doesn't have any underlying illness that's precipitating their presentation. This is a video clip from the British on a series on ways to die. Uh, and they're looking for the perfect way to die. This is not appropriate for COVID times where everybody is depressed. Um, this is in no way an endorsement of finding painless ways to die, but I wanted you to have a disclaimer if you're nervous about watching people who may die during a entertainment show, uh, then you might wanna just do your dishes right now. This 
So it's, uh, I really like that video because that's not what any of us think that low blood oxygen looks like. And if this topic really interests you um, and you want to be bothered uh, by, by some of the information that's out there, uh, just Google uh, clips of pilots who are experiencing hypoxia. And there's several anecdotal uh, air traffic control logs of pilots who cannot figure out where to land the plane um, in recreational aircraft. Uh, because they're being affected by the pressurization and it's not until they get really close to the ground that they feel well enough to realize that they've been very confused um, so very interesting presentation um, so what happens when you are in a lower atmospheric pressure which is what happens when you are at altitude is there's the same percentage of oxygen but there is just less pressure of it because all the particles are further apart um, is that gas expands and so conditions like an inner ear infection like otitis media will hurt a lot as uh, most people know from personal experience if you fly with uh, a head cold you're gonna have a lot of pressure in there because the gas is trying to expand and has nowhere to go um, also there's an airline guideline to bivalve casts so you can't get on a plane with a cast without it being sawed uh, apart on both sides so that it's loosely approximated because the swelling in your leg inside the cast could actually cut off your circulation because cast won't change but your legs will swell um, and so again if you are on a skiing vacation break your leg uh, that cast is actually going to have to be cut on both sides before you get on the plane so i want you just to think for a minute uh, about what the flight delays are uh, for each of these conditions uh, this this is a laparoscopic surgery um, and this surgery was done uh, for medical tourism. Someone flew to Thailand, wanted to have their gallbladder taken out there because it was really cheap uh, and inexpensive, it's all cash. And then they could stay in Thailand for a while while they recover, what a good deal. Uh, this is a, a pneumothorax, a ruptured lung. Uh, so a good example of this would be a skier who took a tumble while they were in Colorado skiing, hit a tree and their lung collapsed from the impact. Um, and so there's air in between the pleural lining of the, the thorax and the lung. And, uh, and this here is, of course, a very popular vacation activity, scuba diving. So which one of these can you get back on a plane first? So if you're thinking scuba diving because you've been scuba diving and got back on the plane and didn't think much about it, that's correct. Um, the guideline is usually 24 hours for scuba diving. Um, next is the uh, the pneumo, uh, is the laparoscopic surgery. Um, the guideline used to be seven days. However, I actually gave the same presentation to our surgery department about two months ago during COVID. And one of the participants said that the guideline for laparoscopic surgery has dropped down to about three days, if not 24 hours, um, and that the prior estimate was very, very conservative. And so it's not really a week anymore. You could just go back. Uh, probably within 24 hours to three days, depending on how cautious you want to be. Uh, and then the pneumothorax is a 10 day stay in Colorado, making sure that your lung doesn't collapse again while you are up in, in the air, because um, that could be life threatening. Okay, so does anyone know what this is? So this is the ash and smoke cloud, not from the California fires, uh, good guess. Um, but this is actually taken from the northern pole of the projection of the earth from 2010 when a volcano in iceland exploded and actually created the longest air traffic control delays and flight delays since world war ii grounded a lot of planes uh, for safety reasons and so this is how much just smoke and ash can affect uh, regional flights and Iceland especially because a lot of long flights fly north near the polar surface in order to shorten the duration of your flight. Let's talk about long flights. Uh, economy class syndrome, wondering if any of you have heard of this. The idea is, is that if you sit in economy class, you are cramped and you can't get up and you're very uncomfortable and you are more likely to have medical problems than if you're sitting in first class. If this is true, you can write off your first class ticket uh, pretty much as part of your health savings account. So let's investigate this. I think that's pretty uh, worthwhile. So what, what are the risks for deep vein thromboses uh, or clots in the legs? Uh, so there was a, the, really the most current referenced article is from 2012, uh, which is a while ago, but there's not a lot of new updates with deep vein thromboses. 
Um, and in the journal chest, they found that if you've had a deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, a clot in the lungs, um, or if you have a coagulopathy where your blood is super sticky uh, because you just were born that way, uh, that that is definitely at risk to getting these clots while sitting. Um, if you have a history of active cancer, um, your blood cells are more sticky and you're more likely to get a clot. If you've had recent trauma or surgery, uh, you're more likely to get a clot, and recent is usually within uh, four weeks. Estrogen use, uh, so birth control pills, uh, or any kind of hormonal treatments for other reasons uh, cause an increased risk of clots. Pregnancy is a higher hormone state, also causes an increased risk of clots, and your blood volume doubles, so you've got like more blood to clot anyway. It's actually your plasma that doubles, you have the same number of red cells, but that's a small detail. Uh, and then obesity, uh, and that's just in, in part attributed to not getting up a lot or having a sedentary lifestyle, uh, creates the stasis or lack of flow in, in deep vessels that can lead to clot. So these are known. 100% if you have one of these, um, you're going to be at risk for getting a clot on an airplane. So they took a look at whether the dehydration of the airplane environment, airplanes are about as dry as the Sahara Desert, uh, which is drier than Fresno. Uh, the alcohol intake, so now you're also getting dehydrated because you're drinking and you're, and you're peeing a lot, um, and so you have much less blood volume. Um, and if an economy seat, because you're cramped, make a difference in your risk for having a, a deep vein clot. And they found that no, uh, these things do not pan out as risk factors at all, which it had a very large sample size. But what they did find is if you had a flight that's longer than eight to 10 hours, or if you had a window seat, you are at increased risk of DVT compared to the other passengers. Um, the increased flight length makes sense because you're sitting for a long time and that's how the blood can clock because it's not moving. Um, but the window seat is because they found that passengers who sit near a window seat tend not to want to get up and bother other people. And so they are, they are just in the chair longer more often than someone who's not in a window seat. Uh, so what do you do for uh, prevention? You know, again, these, these clots uh, from flying are rare, but most passengers have more than one risk factor for having a clot. I mean, there are a lot of people in our society who are obese. There are an awful lot of people taking birth control pills. Um, there are an awful lot of people living with cancer who would like to go on vacation. Uh, so this isn't really, these aren't uncommon risk factors. Um, and really, if you want to really think about it, I would say when you're looking at more than a six hour flight, you want to start adding up what your risk factors are. And here are the recommendations. Um, if you have no risk factors, you should walk frequently, stretch your calves, and sit in an aisle seat because you will get up more often. Uh, you should also do that if you have risk factors, but that's pretty much your intervention if you have none of the risk factors. Uh, they do not recommend compression socks aspirin, or Lovenox if you have risk factors. But what I think is really fascinating is if you do have a risk factor for a clot, that compression socks are definitely recommended because you do have a lot of swelling on a flight. But aspirin is not. I have a lot of friends who fly who believe that taking an antiplatelet medication like aspirin is gonna protect them against a DVT. Uh, and it is not protective at all. If you really have a very high risk, these are people that are gonna have to pay an injection of blood thinner during their flight to prevent a clot. Uh, so you're gonna definitely see your doctor if you feel you have more than one risk factor and you're gonna go on a long flight. So again, things that are high risk, uh, flights that are longer than eight to 10 hours, uh, or a window seat, uh, these are when you're gonna really wanna stay, start to pay attention. All right, so what do you do when you have a medical emergency on a flight? The New England Journal of Medicine for free has these video summaries of their papers. And I think it's a really great resource and they're available to everybody, not just subscribers to the journal. So another resource that's great for you. So let's see what they say about this. You're in that half conscious state between wakefulness and sleep on an overnight flight when a voice calls out on the PA system, is there a doctor on board? As you snap awake and identify yourself as a physician and find your way toward the flight attendant, you wonder what sort of emergency is occurring. Do you have the training or experience to assist with the situation? What about medical liability? In this journal article, investigators report the epidemiology of in-flight medical emergencies using data from the records of a medical communication center that served a number of airlines from 2008 through 2010. Approximately 12,000 emergencies were reported on 7 million flights. There was one emergency for every 600 flights. Viewed another way, there were 16 emergencies per 1 million passengers. 
The most common complaints were lightheadedness, syncope, respiratory distress, and nausea and vomiting. The most feared complications, cardiac arrest and obstetrical emergencies, each accounted for less than 1 in 200 cases. The aircraft was diverted in less than 1 in 10 cases. The most commonly used treatments were oxygen, intravenous saline, and aspirin. An AED was applied to 137 patients with a shock delivered in only five cases. Given these stats, what should you be doing and thinking as you approach the emergency? Is the patient making respiratory efforts and can he or she talk? While you introduce yourself, check for a pulse. If the patient appears stable, take a history directed toward the chief complaint. As you size up the situation, ask yourself, what's in the differential diagnosis? And is there a condition where waiting for the flight to come to its scheduled end would not be in the patient's best interest? Talk with the people at the communication center and get their advice. They know this territory and can provide guidance. The pilot will want to know whether to divert or not, and if not, whether the plane needs to be met by emergency medical personnel. You should think through the answers to these questions as you attend to your patient. With respect to liability, the authors note, that the 1998 Aviation Medical Assistance Act includes a Good Samaritan provision, which protects passengers who offer medical assistance from liability outside of gross negligence or willful misconduct. While there's no legal obligation to intervene, when someone could benefit from your experience, I think you should provide it. Yeah, so these little um, abstract summaries are a great way to, this is my preferred way of reading the literature nowadays, you just hit play. <laughs> um, but so the, uh, the issues that were brought up in the video are pretty much common complaints, uh, and that has a lot to do with the physiology of air travel diversion. Uh, how to approach the situation, I usually give this talk to physicians, um, and you would think physicians would be very confident um, in, in responding to in-flight emergencies, but a lot of people are nervous that without having the backup of the nursing, the staff, the hospital environment tests, uh, how, how good are they going to be able to diagnose what's going on? Uh, and so having a stepwise approach is very helpful in these situations. And then liability. Now, keep in mind, this is just one article. There are other articles that have looked at exactly the same thing that we talked about earlier on. And their chief complaints are different than the ones that this article brought up. Um, so one is the Journal of Travel Medicine. One is the New England Journal of Medicine. And one is the FAA. And if you take a look, uh, even though syncope was really big in the New England Journal article, uh, if you look at the Journal of Travel Medicine, GI symptoms were more common. And what would make the difference in this, I mean, really remarkably different uh, group of complaints taking the lead? Well, the population is different. The Journal of Travel Medicine article was based on Asian airlines. Uh, and so the nausea and vomiting and GI complaints were much more common uh, on the Asian airline population than they were in the U.S population, which is interesting to note. Um, but other things like trauma and psychiatric emergencies, OB emergencies, those are all equally low in their occurrence, and those are probably some of the more difficult ones to deal with. Um, in terms of diversion, it's just interesting to know if a physician is on the flight, uh, it's much more likely to be diverted. Um, but I take some sort of solace in this because, you notice the other group that's very likely to divert the plane is the flight attendant. And I figure they're trained to deal with this. And so if we're on the same page, then clearly we must be doing the right thing. Um, interestingly, if you look at the emergency medical technician wedge, people who assess folks in the pre-hospital setting all the time, they are very unlikely to divert the plane. They are much more comfortable in this type of environment than a physician is. So just kind of an interesting takeaway. Um, what does it cost to divert a plane? There are estimates all over the map, and this isn't really your decision. Um, you can recommend diversion, but the pilot can say no. Uh, <laughs> and you can say, thank you so much for considering my recommendation. Uh, it can cost around $15,000. That seems to be a pretty solid estimate for a domestic flight. Um, an international flight, depending on the issues of dumping fuel, uh, finding a different landing site, can cost anywhere from $100,000 to $1 million to divert the plane. And so there are a lot of reasons that they may not divert the whole aircraft for just one passenger. Uh, keep in mind that if there is an emergency on your flight that you may not be in this little bubble on the right saying volunteer requested. They might handle the entire problem without ever asking overhead for anyone to help. And so if you are having a medical emergency on a flight and you're wondering why no one cares, uh, realize the flight attendant could contact the pilot and the pilot says no. I, I do not want you asking for volunteers. 
I, I don't want anyone to be aware there's a problem. Um, we will handle this ourselves. Or the pilot can talk to the ground consultation crew, which is a medical facility in Pittsburgh, if you're in the US, and uh, they could advise not to ask for a volunteer as well. So don't feel like it's not that they don't care about you. But the pilot is ultimately in charge of that ship. Even if you are dying, uh, they have the ultimate decision on what happens with the plane. Uh, diversion has a lot of components to consider. Uh, just besides the welfare of the patient, you'd think that diverting would always be the best idea. Um, that's not always true. Uh, sometimes you might, might do better and save more time not diverting the flight. Um, and it's really only worth doing if diverting would stabilize the patient sooner. Um, airport availability is also an issue. Um, and also an availability of ground medical transport once you land. Uh, and then again, fuel is another concern, uh, not of us, but of the pilot. <clears throat> it's interesting to know that whether or not there's a physician on your flight, uh, there is not a statistically significant difference in your outcome. Um, it is best if someone treats you in the seat. Uh, it is even better if they take your vitals. That means they've been to a talk like this and we're told very specifically if you're going to see the patient take vitals because it looks like you're doing something um, because there actually are very few interventions you can do on the plane. Um, it's also nice to document. When I do this, I document usually on a napkin and then have the, the person who's had a problem take the napkin with them um, to definitive care when they land. And ask for the medical kit. Uh, there is a medical kit on the plane. And if you use the medical kit, uh, it turns out, statistically speaking, the condition of the patient will be worse if the stuff in the kit is used. But that's a chicken and egg problem. It could be the sicker people require stuff from the kit. And so it's just incidental that it happened to be worse outcome. So what's not to do? Here is a kind of humorous interlude of how not to handle an in-flight complaint. In-flight emergency. <laughs> um, if you do ask for the medical kit, I'd like you to know that there was no mandated equipment on airplanes until 2001, which was not a good year for flying. Um, and they decided that maybe they should have some medical things on board all airplanes. Uh, and so I'll just give you a second to look at that. And then they decided in 2014 that they wanted to add to that. And so they added all of these items in addition to the list you just saw. So what can you do with these medications? I just wanna go over some, some basic things that those medications will help with. Um, you certainly can do basic first aid. You can treat asthma, pain control, and allergic reactions with what's in the kit. You can also do advanced first aid and give uh, intravenous or intramuscular glucose for a hypoglycemic patient, and you can also give epinephrine. Um, you also can use a needle to needle attention pneumothorax. Um, however, you should know that most of the time attention pneumothorax does not occur in the in-flight environment, and most of the patients that have been needled on a plane by a physician did not have this diagnosis. Um, and so just try to stop people before they come at you with a sharp object. Um, you also can do advanced cardiac life support uh, with a basic life-saving airway with a bag valve mask um, with the medications. And you can also give lidocaine, epinephrine, and atropine, which are really common medications for cardiac emergencies in flight. I'm going to play you one more uh, video because of our warm up. The time is a little short. Um, so this is just a comedic video about flying is stressful. And then we're going to wrap up on some of the key things that you need to know. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! For the last time, the flight is delayed. Huh? Do you see a plane out there? Do you? Huh? We are not going anywhere until there is a plane out there. It was the little things that got to me, like... Excuse me! People. That's funny, because you know I could have sworn that I said rows 22 or higher! I wasn't really myself. Only two carry on items! <laughs> the seatbelt sign is on! I never want to go through that again. So that's actually uh, a nicotine ad. Uh, for a nicotine patch. <laughs> very, very funny. Um, so I just wanted to go through some specific recommendations. Um, for shortness of breath, you can give oxygen. If it persists, you descend if you think that there's a gas expanding event. Um, for chest pain, you can give oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. If this goes for more than 15 minutes, you might want to recommend diversion. 
Abdominal pain, again, if you think there's a reason that gas is expanding, you might want to descend to a lower altitude. For confusion, you want to give oxygen, sugar, um, and make sure that someone is breathing okay, and laying them on their side is an easy way to do that. If it continues, uh, you might want the plane to be diverted. If someone passes out, you can give oxygen. If they stay passed out, you can raise their legs in the aisle so that the blood can return to their head. Anaphylaxis, there's Benadryl and, and epinephrine. If that continues more than 15 to 30 minutes, uh, you're really going to want to consider diverting. Someone who's unresponsive can get sugar or oxygen. If you're pulseless, you do CPR and apply an AED. Uh, and decompression sickness, again, you're going to descend and give oxygen. And if it's been less than 24 hours, that plane should be diverted in decompression sickness. So I'm going to skip this. Um, and we have talked about how you're not required to act. But the key points of the talk are that in-flight medical emergencies are quite rare. Um, and that you're flying at around 8,000 feet where there's a lower oxygen pressure. And economy class syndrome is unfortunately a myth, and this is not going to be part of your health savings account expenses. Um, the presenting complaint in the U.S. is usually passing out or a GI complaint like nausea, vomiting, or stomach pain. The only times that a planer is really diverted appropriately is when there's a concern for a vascular emergency, like a heart attack or stroke, or confusion or ultra mental status that persists. In general, people are more protected if they act and help. Uh, and so hopefully if this happens to you on a plane, someone comes and helps. Um, and medical issues are something that even a radiologist knows a lot about. Um, and so I, I always encourage people to act. So this is what really generally we tell people to do. Um, if we have a minute, I'm going to look at summary, yes or no, for a final air emergency. OK. Uh, this is, again, has nothing to do with the topic, except that it's in an airline. Try this one, Marla. Oh, I love that one. It really suits me. Yeah, it does. I don't think a woman can smell enough like a flower, do you, Marla? That's good, Jadine. I'm commandeering this plane! What? 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 I'm commandeering this... <laughs> Sit down, sir. The seatbelt sign is on. You're making a nuisance of yourself. And upsetting this disabled child. This should be in the overhead locker. You could have someone's eye out with that irresponsible... Oh, Marla! What is this? Sir, you are only allowed 20 kilograms of hand luggage, so if you're trying to get one over on us, you've picked the wrong air stewardesses. Electronic slimming belts don't work here. No, they do not, Marla. Sit down, sir. The seatbelt sign is on. Diet and exercise. That is how Marla and I have maintained our trim figures. Look and whip, fat boy. We are now approaching Johannesburg. Thank you for flying Air Afrikaans today. We look forward to seeing you on your return flight. Except you, fatty. <laughs> so I just really want to thank you for your attention, um, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. And I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I really even more so hope that uh, you're really looking forward to your next flight. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spano. That was really good. Um, I learned a lot. I've had, I've been on the plane twice when there were emergencies. One time it was a headache and there was another family physician who was able to take care of it. So I didn't have to get involved. Um, and then the other time it was, uh, it, I, it was an older woman who got on the plane, but then didn't, and she was like, I don't feel good. So we actually couldn't even leave. And they wanted a physician to determine if they could leave. And I was like, well, we're still at the airport. Why do I have to help out with this? So they were able to uh, get that person off the plane and get appropriate help. And then we left um, the airport after that. So the flight was delayed by two hours, but luckily I didn't have to do anything. So that was good. <laughs> there are some questions. There was a good question that I saw. Um, is it why isn't there a protocol for there to always be a few medical providers on flights, like a nurse or NP or PA as part of the normal flight crew? I think you sort of answered that question, but if you don't mind uh, repeating that, that'd be great. Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I'm not sure the FAA really takes it as part of their obligation to um, ensure the safety of passengers. Um, and I would back that up by saying I have seen passengers on airplanes that I'm pretty sure will die during the flight. 
that I have no idea why anyone sold them a ticket. Um, but no one's going to stop grandma from like her last visit uh, to the grandchildren. Um, so, you know, again, I, I just feel like that hasn't been deemed as part of the scope of the FAA, which is the only organization that could really enforce that. Another question was, why are compression socks not recommended on flights? So if you don't have any risk factors for uh, having a deep vein thrombosis, so none of those risk factors, you don't take uh, contraceptive pills, you are not obese, uh, then you are very, very low risk of getting a clot in the flight. Um, and so it's not that they're not recommended. If they make you feel comfortable, you should wear them. Uh, but that being said, they are in no way preventative because once the incidence of a condition is super, super low, it's hard to make it even lower. Um, so if you have like a one in a million chance of getting a clot, um, adding and adding the compression socks makes it, you know, less than half of one in a million. Uh, that's just not a statistically significant difference. So it's just really a, a math question, not are compression socks great? People do like them. There is a question about your brand, uh, specialty that you're, you know, not just emergency medicine, but why did you choose wilderness medical, uh, wilderness medicine, and can you t talk a little bit about it? Absolutely. Uh, I chose wilderness medicine because I was really impressed with how UCSF Fresno was a leader in the field. So about 30 years ago, uh, you may not know this, uh, National Park Service Rangers in all of our national parks really weren't able to provide medical care until UCSF Fresno created the Park Medic Program, which trained rangers to provide medical care on scene in national parks. And this was actually prompted by a, a caver who got a femur fracture in Soldier Cave in Sequoia Kings Canyon. And at the time, since the, nobody could give medications, a nurse from a hospital who knew how to cave went in with a syringe of morphine in her teeth under the order of an anesthesiologist at a hospital, drove to the cave, went in, gave the morphine so that the rangers could get the patient out. Um, and that was determined that that was not practical. And all of the protocols for the national parks are written in Fresno um, by residents and faculty here. And so it's really just an ideal place. We are a national leader in wilderness medicine. Um, we are one of the first programs to offer a fellowship in wilderness medicine along with Stanford and Harvard. Uh, so we just have a long heritage of, of, of making some really specialty changing advances uh, that other people look to. So it was a very natural choice. Thank you very much, Dr. Spano. Uh, it seems like everybody enjoyed your talk. They loved all the videos, so thank you for that. I think that made it very entertaining and educational at the same time, so that was really nice. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right, so it is six o'clock. Um, what I'm going to do is before I introduce Dr. Jambanathan, who is our pediatric intensive care specialist, I'm going to introduce Dr. Martin, who you might have noticed in our top in the video. Uh, she's actually one of the emergency medicine residents who's helping with this um, mini med school series, just helping, uh, you know, moderate the chat and answer any questions you guys might have. Uh, she's actually a Fresno native. Uh, she went to Central High School um, and she went to, for med, um, undergrad, she did at UC Davis and for med school, she actually went all the way to Michigan and went to Michigan State and then matched at uh, UCSF Fresno for her emergency medicine residency. And she's a great resident to work with. It's been awesome to work with for the last couple of years. Um, and her interest, main interest is community outreach. Uh, so this is the main reason she's also joining us because this is very educational for the community and it's been, um, I've enjoyed it and I hope she likes it as well throughout the series. So hello, Jessica. Thank you for joining us. And now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Krishnan Jambanathan. He is actually, he grew up in India. Uh, he, in the state of Punjab. So that's where I'm from. So that's how we connected. Uh, Cause I did not expect him to speak Punjabi given his name, which is more like a South Indian name, but he, he took me by surprise for sure. So that's awesome. Uh, he completed his medical schooling from Bayanand Medical College in Punjab. And then he completed his residency training in pediatrics at 
at St. Joseph Children's Hospital in New Jersey, and then as a part of the Mount Sinai program, which is um, in New York, I believe. Um, and then went to, did his fellowship in pediatric critical care at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Um, he has been doing this for 30 years now, 20 years of this as a pediatric ICU physician, which is amazing. Uh, he joined us, I want to say, what, two years ago, Dr. Christian? Yep. Yeah, two years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, he, you know, apart from taking care of sick children, which is his main job, he's passionate about medical education and training young pediatricians, which is awesome. His Some of his interests are, he's a huge sports fan, so if you have any questions about sports, go all out. Uh, he loves traveling and spending time with the family. Uh, all right, Dr. Christian, I am going to let you take over, and we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sujit, for the very kind words out there. And well, to all the participants here, this is my first time in being involved in the mini med school out here. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting format. And I wanted to thank Dr. Spano for a very interesting lecture. Even after 30 years, I learned so much, even just in her 20 minutes of listening into her. And I learned a lot, appreciate that a lot. And what I'm going to do today, from what I was told, the predominant a number of all the participants are most of them are tend to be high school students or are undergrad students correct and that is my understanding and most of that and so i was trying to uh develop my a talk essentially so that i could give everybody else a picture into the world i live in or the world that i work in and for that purpose only there's thought okay maybe i should this is what i practice i practice in the pediatric icu and I, at least I can give you, a, everybody else, a glimpse into my world out there, what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and how it has come to be what we are doing right now over a period of time. And we just will take you down a walk down memory lane out there, as they say. And my understanding of history, everything is, I've been, this, somebody told me this, and these are the words which I remember. History is nothing but thinking about the past to better understand the present and to improve the future. That is exactly what is the story about. So it is basically, that is history. If you don't, if it's not going to be applied to the present and learning for the future, it's no use. Okay, so that is where I start my talk today is the pediatric ICU story, contributions, development, and challenges. And I've tried to keep it I'm not focusing too much on medical details as much as I am on the first story part of things. Oh, it's not the toy story. I guess it's the pick you story, right? That's what it is. The pediatric ICU, as you must know, is, the, is just a short for pediatric intensive care unit. How do I define it? It's what I can essentially talk about it as if it's a specialized area of the hospital where the very sickest of pediatric patients are admitted, right? That is what I would say a pediatric ICU is. Um, it's not trying to. Okay. Now I have a question for the audience. And all the poor people, you can answer this question. You can just put it in your chat. You don't have to respond by uh, directly. You can put it in the chat and Dr. Dillon or, or Summer would collate the answers for us and let us know. And I will give you the answer a few days uh, in a few slides down the line. Okay. What is the age group of patients admitted to a pediatric ICU? It's just for, is it only newborns? Is it zero through eight years of age? Is it zero through 14, zero through 18, or zero through 21? Or all comers are taken. That's the sixth option there. So you can, you can all put it in your text out there, what exactly is that? And I'll try to answer that question just down the line here. Okay. You see two pictures here. One, both are of excellent things. The first one is one of the best engines in the world. It belongs to a Mercedes car. The second one is one of the best basketball players in the world, LeBron James. Some of them, some of you might question me if you're not a Lakers fan, but I'm a LeBron fan. He's, I think he's the best basketball player in the world. There is one thing common to them, either one of them, and that is, both of them are useless without the rest of their team. What is the team of the engine? Happens to be the cars, wheels, steering wheel, axle, the body of the car, everything, exhaust pipe, everything else. 
and LeBron's team is the rest of his Laker teammates. Those, in, neither the engine nor LeBron in isolation can do anything. They need the rest of the team and it is the most important thing. Without their team, they may be the best, but they are no good. The same goes for the pediatric ICU also. The pediatric ICU functions as a team. It has four solid legs. What are the four solid legs of the team? The first leg is that of the physicians and surgeons. This team of physician and surgeons is essentially led by a pediatric intensivist, and it includes the patient's primary pediatrician, the, all the pediatric subspecialists who are involved in the care of the patient, and also various varieties or kinds of surgeons, the general, the cardiac neurosurgeon, ENT surgeon, trauma surgeon, all depending upon the kind of problem the patient has. The second and the third legs of this, of this table are the nursing as, and the ancillary support team. The nursing includes the bedside critical care nurse, the charge nurse who has got clinical and as well as administrative duties, we have the ancillary team, which includes respiratory therapy, pharmacy, nutrition, social work, child life specialist, nursing technician, lab technician, and even the clinical staff in the, who work in the pediatric ICU have a significant role to play so that things work smoothly. Those are the second and the third team, of third leg of the table there. The fourth leg, which is kind of understated or not mentioned much at all in the pediatric ICU perhaps is the family. The patient's family. is It is integral to the pediatric ICU team taking care of the patient out there. In an adult world, it does not matter as much as the patients can make potentially to make decisions for themselves. But in the pediatric world, the family is the surrogate decision maker for the patient. So obviously, if we don't involve the family, it makes things really, really difficult for everybody. To. Now, coming to the answer, Dr. Dillon, what do you think was the majority of the patient, the majority of the audience answered? Majority of the people said zero to 18, and then there were a couple zero to 21. Well, Actually, it looks like the audience is very well educated. The California Children's Services or CCS says that and a PICU can admit anywhere from zero through 21 years of age. And this varies in other states and the, generally the upper limit varies between 18 to 21 years with always there are exceptions. There, there can always be exceptions made depending on some specific cases because if a patient with some pediatric specific condition has not yet transitioned to adult care. They, even if they are over 21 or 22, 23 years of age, they may still be taken care of in the PICU. But traditionally, it is zero through 21 years of age as far as the California, state of California is concerned. Okay, now this is going on to the next question. I just want, do your people, does the audience have an idea of how many years of education slash training after high school does it take to become a pediatric intensivist? Is it four years, eight years, 11, 14, 18? You can all take your guesses and answer the same way as, a, as you answered the previous question, and I will come back to it later. Now, I said in one of my earlier slides that the pediatric ICU takes care of the sickest patients. What does the sickest mean? Essentially, for any parent, even if the child has a cold, the child is the sickest. Obviously, that's the parent's perspective, absolutely. But we have to have some, some way of finding out what does the sickest patient mean. We, so I'm just putting here together a list of conditions which, which can potentially come to the PICU, but this list doesn't even scrape the surface. It just gives you a, just a basic outline of some of the conditions which can come to the PICU pediatric ICU, it could be severe respiratory illnesses like bad asthma, bronchiolitis, severe pneumonias, or, or a condition known as acute respiratory distress syndrome. Patient can have heart failure, he could be in shock, he could have a congenital heart disease. He might have been born with, he or she might have been born with a heart problem and that presents later on. Poisonings, snake bites, Neuro, you could have tumors in the brain, spinal cord, meningitis, encephalitis, 
cancer, various blood disorders, immune system conditions, renal kidney failures, complications from diabetes, major trauma, such as brain injuries, vascular, any blood vessel injuries, or any, any of the solid organ injuries like liver or spleen injuries, they all come to the pediatric ICU. Or even patients who undergo surgery for various conditions, if they are major surgeries who, who require uh, close monitoring in the post-operative period, they can come to the PQ. It could be any surgical repair of congenital heart disease, which would be, or you can have patients with organ transplants who have received a new heart, a new liver, a new kidney, or, an, or even a new intestine. Or bone marrow transplant patients can come to the ICU after their bone marrow transplant because they need to be protected from infections or they might have landed up with an infection or any other major surgery requiring close monitoring, which could be spinal surgery, extensive neurosurgery, or even extensive surgery within the belly. You can, all of these things can come up to the PICU. So this is just an outline. It does not, as I said, it might have touched 1% of what the number of variety of kids which can come to the pediatric ICU. Now, coming back to my original question, how many years of education training after high school does it take to become a pediatric intensivist? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dillon, what did they think? I would say the majority said 11 or 14, followed mm -hmm. by eight. Okay, the correct answer is 14 years is the minimum according to the current standards in the United States. After high school or after high school graduation, they need four years of undergrad, four years of med school, three years of a pediatric residency, and three years of fellowship training to become a pediatric intensivist, which adds up to 14. So 14 is the, at this point, with exceptions, obviously, depending on the condition, but 14 is the minimum time frame you need to become a pediatric intensivist in the United States as far as current conditions go. Just a few years of your life. What matters? How does it matter, right? So what are the things that we can do in the PICU? There are a lot of things we can do and some things we should not do, but there are, I just wanted to give you just a pictorial representation of what are the thing, kind of things that we can do out here in the pediatric ICU. Whenever a patient is admitted to the pediatric ICU, and if a family member or a friend or a sibling walks into that room out there, it can be a pretty daunting environment out there. You see lights, you see wires, you see tubes, you see monitors, you see alarms going off. Every 60 seconds or 30 seconds, something is beeping and you see pumps out there. So all these are done with a purpose. We can monitor a lot of things, a lot of physiological variables. You can monitor heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, oxygen level. You can monitor even how much your, your heart, how, what is the blood volume your heart is putting out every minute. All those things are, that is your cardiac output. We can monitor a hundred, we can variety of things, but just because we can monitor does not mean we should. It just depends on what we need to monitor, okay? So first thing which I said is we can monitor a lot of things in the pediatric ICU. We can even breathe for the patient in the pediatric ICU. When I say we can breathe for the patient, it can just be just helping a patient to breathe or take over the breathing totally. In the first picture here, you can see, in this picture here, you can see a baby with a, with a, a small mask fitted onto the nose out there. And that is just helping the baby breathe. The baby is breathing and that is helping in the, uh, accentuating the baby's breathing or helping the breathing along. And the second and the third pictures, you can, if you look closely, it may not be as clearly visible, but here the patients have a breathing tube put down their throat into their windpipe. And the first pair, the patient in the middle is on a regular ventilator and on the patient on the right side is on a special type of a ventilator, which is called an oscillator. That is for a different lecture, I guess, going over the details. But these are all different types of breathing machines which can help, and help us in taking over the breathing of a patient. We can also do the job of failing organs. Like if the kidneys fail or for a patient, then we can, there are machines, the equipment which we have, specialized equipment, and we can take over the job of the kidney. Normally, the kidneys help in cleaning out the blood of all toxic elements in there and it helps anything waste products are eliminated by the kidneys if the kidneys fail 
we need this machine, which is called a dialysis machine, which is again of two different varieties. You can have a regular hemodialysis or what we call as continuous renal replacement therapy machines, which, we can, which can help us in doing the job of the kidneys. A similar setup can be used for, uh, even for doing the job of a liver, but those are different. Machines look similar, but they are different out there, obviously in the function. We can take care of patients with severe head injuries out there. You can see the picture on the left. There is a small tube coming out of the skull out there. If you focus closely, you can see this thing. If where my arrow is point, pointing out there, that is a monitor which monitors the pressure inside the brain, right next to the uh, inside, right in the center of the brain. It monitors the pressure there inside the skull. And obviously, this patient is is also having a breathing machine attached to him, and. We can take care of patients with severe traumatic brain, what we call as TBI is traumatic brain injuries. If a patient's heart or lung is not working or heart and lung are not working, either of the two, no problem. We can take care of the, take over the, the job of the heart or the job of the lung or job of the heart and lung both with a machine, with a device called ECMO. And what does ECMO stand for is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It is a very highly kind of ever technologically advanced machine which helps in doing the job of either the heart or the lungs or both together if we need them. For, for simplistic ways, you can put it, ECMO is nothing, is just a heart-lung bypass machine outside the operating room. Okay, we can feature with tubes but through the nose going to the stomach or pass the stomach into the small intestine or we can feed them pre-digested food, which is already comes in the form of solutions straight into their bloodstream. Because eventually all food is digested and is absorbed, taken into the bloodstream and we can digest. We prepare, we have prepared pre-digested food in the form of what we call as parental nutrition. We can do that. So there are ways of doing that also. And one of the things we do always do as a pediatric ICU team is we care for patients as a team. And as I mentioned earlier, across the board, this team, uh, this, uh, this mantra of the team will always continue throughout this entire talk. And that is, the, that is the mantra we always follow. That is what we do as a, on a day in and day out basis is we care for the patients as a team. Now, how did we come to where we are? And in the sense, it is obviously it's not, it did not uh, start suddenly yesterday, it was built and today we are doing everything out there. It has taken a long, hard road. So, so let me just take you down a walk memory lane, okay? So we, let's go over it. Just to go, just about a, more than a century and a half ago, about somewhere in the middle of the 19th century, if you think about it, 20% of the children born did not see their first birthday. This was in the cities. So one in five kids born did not see their first birthday. And this was in cities. If you look at the rural areas, it might have been even worse. And even those who made it past their first birthday, 25% of those did not make it to adulthood. And if you do the math, it essentially comes to roughly 40% of those who were born did not grow, get to adulthood. 40% is a huge number, almost one in two, almost one in two, if not, it's one in 2.5 to be precise if you go by math. But almost half the people who were of the kids who were born did not make it to adult life. That was a sad fact. But then, fortunately for us, there is a bunch of events happened which fundamentally changed the face of modern medicine. And without in, not in any specific order, I'll go through them. The first thing was ether anesthesia was demonstrated to be effective by Dr. William Morton. This gentleman was a dentist in Boston and he de demonstrated that and he used ether for his patients and it, was, it worked and he demonstrated it at the Harvard Medical School. And essentially since then, what it made, were, what it made possible was for surgeries to happen. Extensive, there was, you could only do minor surgeries prior to that without effective anesthesia. Now with this anesthesia on, they could do a lot of surgeries and over time, the, uh, what do you call the, the severity of the surgeries or how 
whether it was a minor surgery, it became more and more complex surgeries could be done over a period of time. The second thing which happened was nursing became an integral part of medicine. Nursing was always there, it was kind of scattered. And this lady in the picture, I'm sure many of you would know that, was known as the lady with the lamp or also called Florence Nightingale. She is also called as the mother of modern nursing, as, as she was the one credited with modern nursing, developing modern nursing. Uh, she was an aristocratic, uh, aristocratic English lady who essentially took up, she belonged to a rich family, well to, very well-to-do family, and she essentially took up the job of nursing and she led a team of nurses to the Crimean War in around, it was 1852 in Turkey, it was, and it was a British, uh, it was a military hospital there. She took a team of volunteers there and took care of the soldiers who were wounded in that hospital. And just with, there were no, remember there were no antibiotics at that time. There were nothing known as antibiotics, just you would clean the wound, clean the wound, and essentially just by maintaining simple hygiene, and humane care, they decreased the mortality of, of the soldiers in that who were admitted to the hospital from 40% to 2%. It is humongous and mind boggling, 20 times less. So it was like 40% of the soldiers used to die before they, her team went there. Now, now only 2% of the soldiers die. Imagine that. She also established the first modern nursing school in the Western world at St. Thomas Hospital in London. And even some of the pioneers in American nursing, like a lady by the name of Clara Barton, was trained by Florence Nightingale in her school at St. Thomas. Then this gentleman by the name of Joseph Lister, those who have heard of him, he was a, he was a surgeon, general surgeon in the, in the United Kingdom. He, for the first time, till till the mid 1800s or even till 1860 and 65 and even a few years later, people always believed that whenever any wound infection happened or something, it was due to bad humors, which would be the reason why wound infection happened. Nobody connected bacteria and infection. He was one of the first to do that. And he reported his findings in Lancet in 1866 and he used antisepsis and he used carbolic acid to, for his uh, operating room. And he used to clean the room with car carbolic acid and maintained asepsis and his, also his wounds with carbolic, diluted carbolic acid and he decreased mortality significantly. Unfortunately, it took the Britishers another 20 years before they accepted his findings, whereas the French and the Germans just ran with his findings and they improved their, got better results in their surgeries and everything much before the British did. During the mid-19th century, children did not have any rights. No, the, the, whole, the whole concept of children having rights was not even there. And if they happened to be poor children, sorry, you're out of luck, right? But there was this gentleman by the name of Abraham Jacobi. He was one of, he was an immigrant pediatrician. He was a German Jewish pediatrician who who was essentially, I think if I can remember correctly, he came into the United States around 1850 or 1852, somewhere in that period. His main job was he advocated strongly for the rights of children. And, we, and he also advocated for cohorting sick children in a clean, safe environment. That was a unique concept, cohorting sick children in a, in a safe, clean environment. You know, even middle class, whatever the middle class was defined as at that point of time, even the middle class could not afford a very good, clean, safe environment for their children at that point of time in the mid, in the mid 1800s, it's the 19th century. And he was also eventually responsible for the opening of the children's wing, first children's wing at Mount Sinai Hospital in, uh, in New York. He also became the president of the AMA and the American Medical Association much later in his career. And till date, he remains the only immigrant who has reached that position, being the president of the American Medical Association. There has been no immigrant who has, apart from him, till date, who has been elected president of the AMA. With advocacy by pediatricians and physicians and other uh, different right activists like that, around the same period, they started opening up children's hospitals and and opened up in 
Boston, Philadelphia, and New York had children's hospitals come up. And all these children's hospitals had some version of what we, I would like to call PICU precursors. They were large, sunny lit rooms out there. They had a lot of nurses, they had clean linens, and they had a piano in most of them, which, is, which was in place of today's television, I guess. And there was a, I wish we, can, we are in better, older times are better than modern times, I guess. And immunizations were still not there at that point of time. They still had a lot of vaccine preventable diseases, a lot of patients coming in, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, all those things were still hugely prevalent. The only vaccine which was available around at that time was smallpox. Like. And the fact that treating children different than adults was a unique concept. It was not children, we, we all talk about it, children are not young adults. That's a, that's a slogan which we all repeat. But 150 years ago, nobody even thought of that. Oh, let's treat them the same way as that is what they would do. Around the same time, uh, just a little later in 1892, around they started developing neonatal or infant ICUs developed in Europe. And this was a gentleman by the name of Tarnier and his student by the name of Pierre Boudin. They opened up the first infant ICU in 1892 in France. And they increased the survival in babies who were two kilograms, born 2,000 gram babies. Nowadays, nowadays, nobody even thinks of 2,000 gram baby as being, oh, that's something very abnormal. But in those days, 2,000 gram babies, only one in three babies survived. If there were two kilograms in weight, 34% was the survival rate. And they developed this incubator for babies to keep them warm. And they, just by maintaining simple cleanliness and using this incubator, they increased the survival from 34% to 67%, if effectively doubling the survival of babies out there. There's an interesting story about this incubator out there. This gentleman, Mr. Tarnier, was, grew up in a farm. He was a, obviously he's an obstetric physician who was an obstetrician, but he grew up in a farm. His, I, he got the idea of developing an incubator for babies from chicken. They used incubators to keep the eggs warm, to hatch chicken out, to, to, for chicken out there, and that gave him the idea to develop an incubator for babies to keep them warm. So, hey, so the not, farmers are important, not just for food, even for the babies. Okay. Now the concept of neonatal ICU started developing and by the early 1900s, NICU started coming up in the United States and the concept of cohorting sick children was firmly established by then. It, was, it had been 50 years since children's hospitals had started coming up and the success of the neonatal ICUs created a need for the pediatric ICU. People did not know that till then, but still the fact is if you have a neonatal ICU, more kids are coming, are surviving. So they're, they, there'll be more kids who are older, but medically fragile kids out there. And so now you need another place for them as they get older or as they graduate out of their NICU to provide healthcare for them to address their needs. So they were creating a need for the ICU. Another thing happened in the early part of the, in the 20th century, in the early 1900s was poliomyelitis. You don't, nowadays medical students in the United States do not even know about poliomyelitis because it's so uncommon or it's essentially been eradicated in the United States. It's not even there. But in, there are still there in couple, it's been eradicated from most countries in the world. But there was a variety of polio. There are multiple, uh, two or three, three different kinds of poliomyelitis. One of those varieties suppresses your breathing. You cannot, it makes it impossible or very difficult for you to breathe. And so for that, the physicians and, so, and actually engineers and physicians worked together and they came up with something called an iron, iron lung, which was a kind of a ventilator, which was developed by, by the, these two gentlemen, Philip Drinker, who was an engineer, and uh, Dr. McCann, who was, a pedi who was a pediatrician. And both of them were in Boston and they developed the iron lung. Once with the development of the iron lung, respiratory care units developed significantly. And that was unknowingly a big boost for respiratory as well as intensive care. All over the world and even the, across the United States, adult and pediatric polio units opened up. And 
you know, the monitoring at that point of time, if there was there was no modern pulse ox, you had a monitor hooked up, things beeping, no, nothing like that. It was just the bedside nurse who was used as a monitor who used to go and look at the patient, see the patient, what is his heart rate, see how the patient is breathing, feel for the pulse, look at the color of the patient, all those things. And the, the nurse was the ultimate monitor. And so, and along with that, the next, the vaccines came around. In 1954 and 57, we had the Salk and Sabin vaccine for polio that kind of ended the polio era abruptly, positive thing, but it ended the polio era abruptly in the United States, which is a good thing for the public in general. But also polio played a role in the developing the different kinds of ventilators for us also. This picture is that of a iron lung, as you can see, the whole body is inside that machine, just the head and neck is outside, you can barely see that, okay? And this is a picture of the polio wards which were there at that point of time. All you see is iron lungs all around. This is actually from Los Angeles. It is called Rancho Mirage Hospital or something, I don't know the name of it exactly, but this picture is from a polio ward in Los Angeles out there. So other things were happening simultaneously at that point of time, which helped in the development of pediatric intensive care unit. There was a major progress were being made in pediatric surgery and cardiac surgery. We had Dr. William Ladd, who was also considered the father of pediatric surgery, who was the first chief in Boston Children's Hospital, of uh, Boston of pediatric surgery, chief of it. And his student, Robert Gross, was actually, was uh, became the next head of the surgical, pediatric surgical program there. And he pioneered congenital heart surgery even before adult heart surgery was a thing. He did, we did not have a big cardiopulmonary machine, bypass machine or anything, but he did surgical surgeries like, uh, he did a PDA surgery repair that he, nowadays it's considered a bedside surgery, but at that time it was big, huge. Then it, it, it did repair the patent ductus arteriosus in a 12 year old girl 12 or 10, some 12 or 10 year old girl, and it was successful in that patient. The patient was with heart failure. His student, or his contemporary essentially, Dr. C. Everett Coop, and became the chief pediatric, uh, was trained under Dr. Gross, and then went on to be the chief pediatric surgeon at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he was responsible for developing multiple complex surgeries, including surgeries for coarctation of the aorta, which was again a cardiac surgery. And he went on to become the Surgeon General of the United States under the Reagan administration. That went, And later on, I've seen him in the early 2000s also, he used to appear in infomercials out there at some point, Dr. Dr. Coop. What this did was demand, this created a demand for specialized post-operative care. And in a way, it also, it essentially created a demand for the pediatric ICU. This gentleman here, by the name of Dr. Peter Seffer, he was he's also considered the father of CPR. He is an, another Austrian Jewish immigrant who came to the United States immediately at the end of the Second World War or uh, for his doing his medical schooling in 1948. And he was he conducted a lot of research on CPR, and he's cons when, when you talk of CPR, you talk of ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Nowadays, they've changed it to just the C is the most prominent part, I guess now. But still, in the pediatric world, we still airway, breathing, and circulation are important. And it is all due to his research. He opened up the first multidisciplinary adult and pediatric ICU in Baltimore, in, in the Baltimore City Hospital in 1958, which essentially was not a separate pediatric ICU, but it had a small pediatric section in, as, as a side wing of the, of the adult ICU out there. And, but that was a good beginning. But at the same time, he, also cre he was also credited with starting a critical care transport system. In prior to those days, even patients who were critically ill or significantly ill, they were transported from one place to another on, a, on literally on a hearse. They used to carry them on, on the back of a hearse out there. And, that is, you know, the amount of space out there. Nobody can treat any other patient. He created a modern transport system where actually patients could be taken care of while they were being actively transported. So these, th all these things helped develop the modern ICE, pediatric ICU. And by the early 60s, ventilators and ventilation techniques improved. And this study, particular study, I'm not going over the study there, but the 
just wanted to mention this. This was conducted at, in Toronto. And what they did was they actually took up a patient, 20 patients with a condition called highland membrane disease, which was considered, or at that point they were, they met criteria for terminal illness. Literally none of those patients were expected to survive. So they put them on a ventilator and they proved they, out of the 20 patients who met criteria for a certain death, eight of them survived. So that was a huge 40% hour where, the, where 0% were expected to survive, 40% survived. And again, this contributed to increase in the NICU survivors and by the same logic which I mentioned earlier, they needed longer support, contributed to the need for pediatric ICUs. And like almost every medical research, Europe took the lead. Europe, the first pediatric ICU was opened up in Europe in Children's Hospital of Gothenburg by Goran Hagland, who was the chief of anesthesia there. And he opened, it was a 12-bedded multidisciplinary peds uh, unit. With It had pediatric nurses, anesthesia house staff were manning those things, that hospital, that ICU. And it had respiratory therapists out there. It was called the emergency care unit there. It was not labeled the PICU, but it was called the emergency care unit. But it was not functioning like an emergency. You could not walk into that unit. A patient could not be brought in there. And then another ICU, pediatric ICU, opened up in Stockholm in 61. In St. Vincent de Paul Hospital, again in Paris, in 1964, they opened up the first pediatrician-led pediatric ICU. Even till the late 80s, most of the pediatric ICUs, even across the world, were led by anesthesiologists. In Liverpool, it was opened up, the Children's Hospital and Alder Hayes Children's Hospital opened up the PQ-64. The United States entered the field a little late, 67. The first PQ at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was opened by Dr. Downs. It was a six-bed multidisciplinary medical surgical unit. It had dedicated nursing, respiratory therapy. It had a good cohort of subspecialists and anesthesia fellows used to staff the pediatric ICU at that point of time. And they had their own blood gas la laboratory, which was kind of unique at that point of time. It, this ICU expanded rapidly. Within seven years, it went from a six-bedded unit to a 20-bedded unit, and within another one year, by 75, it was a 30-bedded unit. Then the floodgates opened up. Literally in 68 through 71, almost everywhere, Mass General Hospital, Hospital for Sick Children, Yale, New Haven Hospital, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Long Island, name it, and everywhere they were started opening pediatric ICUs there. By 1985, the ACGME recognized critical care fellows. And by 1987, they also had started a sub-board certification for pediatric critical care medicine cross board there. So literally in the short span of 67 to 87, within 20 years, just from an initiation of a specialty in, of a unit, pediatric ICU in the United States, you had a full-fledged established subspecialty in 1987. That was within 20 years. And PQ continues to develop and specialize. The number of PQs continue to increase across the country. And now, there's, now there are so many PQs which can be labeled. And so they had to separate PQs into community PQ, tertiaries, and quaternary PQs. Our PQ at Community Regional is a tertiary PQ. It's just one of two tertiary PQs in the Central Valley. And over a period of time, just like any specialty, it became more specialized. Now pediatric ICUs become, we have got into cardiac ICUs, neuro ICUs, nephro ICUs. These are all pediatric cardiac ICU, pediatric neuro and pediatric nephro ICUs. And as I say, no rose comes without a thorn, right? Uh, as this PQs develop, we all face challenges. And today I'm not trying to focus on the medical, pure medical challenges. I'm talking of all the not just administrative, but actually social and other challenges, personal challenges, which we face. So I'll just focus on that. Medicine, as, uh, along with technology and everything, you need to learn new technology, you have new procedures, you have this thing. What are the challenges the pediatric ICUs faced? The first and most important, I would say, is the humanization of care. I would label it as a success and a challenge. We say one of... I'm sure all of you would have realized, or when you talk to anybody who has been in this world for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, who has been, in the, who has been living for that period of time, you'd always realize that along as technology has 
increased, increased in whole pro in the provision of medical care, the human touch seems to have been lost, and that is a, something which is a unique, which is a complaint which anybody, if you, if any of the audience talk to the and anybody who has been around long enough, they will tell you that. Oh, the doctor paid so much attention to me. They paid so. They used to talk to me. Nowadays, they they just look at their numbers. They look at the this thing. They look at some other monitors, and they don't talk to me. Right. So that is the, that aspect of humanization of care. I think if it is still being mentioned, I I would credit pediatrics and pediatric critical care for that particular aspect of medicine out there. Is they we have to be a part. We have to provide. We are not just treating a disease. When it comes to pediatrics, we are, apart from the disease, we are also dealing with the, apart from the patient, we're dealing with the family. We are dealing with the near and dear ones. We are, they, are, they are scared. They are afraid. We have to, it is our job to take care of that. Also address their concerns, address their expectations. That is a part of our, our job there. And pediatrics was, created this concept of family-centered care, which was defined by the American Academy of Pediatrics as approach to the planning, delivery, and evaluation of health care that is grounded in a mutually beneficial partnership amongst patients, families, and providers that recognizes the importance of the family in the patient's life. This was a statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics eight years ago. Okay, And so I think, and I also label it as a challenge because even though we have been doing it, to continue doing it, it needs a constant active approach. It cannot be a passive approach. We have to actively maintain that human aspect of medical care. We work in a critical care environment where we, as I said, we have the sickest of patients. Despite best efforts and best intentions, bad outcomes are inevitable. We do come across them. Death of a child, however, can never be experienced as natural because that is not the natural sequence of events. You expect an older person to die first, not a child to die before the parent. And it is devastating for the family and it is also stressful for the, uh, for the professionals. So we have helped over a period of time, we have involved palliative care and hospice care in, in, to be included in the ICU care of things out there so that they can provide support to the family and even to the healthcare professionals taking care of the patient out there. So, but that is, it's just dealing with bad outcomes is, an, is, in a, is in itself a challenge. And we have become victims of our, I would say we, have, we are victims of our own success. More the survivors, more the patients needing long-term care and stress, on re, and stress on resources has been there. You can see in this cute child in the picture is having, has a tracheostomy and is attached to a ventilator. You don't see the ventilator there, but I can see the tubing attached to the patient out there. And obviously, the child is having a good quality of life. It's smiling, it's playful, and the parents seem to be pretty happy. So, but it does, you need, once you hook a patient onto a ventilator, you need a, you need a ventilator rehab team, you need a pulmonologist, you need an ongoing care out there, we need a home care vent team. All those things are need to be, add to the costs of medicine, add to the stress on resources, and demand for resources is already there. And we also have the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, which helps in taking care of long-term patients who need long-term care. Last, but definitely not the least, is the effect of, is, is this is an important thing which I would like to say, is basically it is not all hunky-dory out there and it's all not all roses. It's definitely physicians, healthcare is a stressful environment. And I don't want to label it to physicians alone, Healthcare is a stressful environment for all providers and ICU environments become even more stressful. This data, and this is the latest data from 2020 National Physician Burnout and Suicide Report out there, comes up with 44%, nearly half of critical care physicians report burnout. And essentially, that is not to say that other, other subspecialists don't undergo that. It is, it is actually... The burnout numbers are the highest in anesthesia, emergency, and critical care. These are the three kind of the highest ones, and obstetricians also, sorry. Obstetricians also have a very high rate of burnout. It comes from the nature of the work. Obviously, it's stressful. You're responsible for somebody else's life out there. It is a constant stressor. 
you every, everyone works long abnormal hours days nights you change back, go back and forth the health changing healthcare environment also plays a role but all these things apart we need as a as a community to learn to de-stress find outcomes or avenues to de-stress and also the systems need to provide professional support to help patient people and the providers to with these situations of stress and burnout how to manage stress in their lives how to manage burnout but i don't want to leave you with a negative aspect here there is hope the contributions of the and the hope is that the contributions of the pioneers in medicine along with the children who served as their guides and the families who lent their support will lead us to a better and brighter future as far as healthcare is concerned thank you if you have now i'll be happy to take any questions that you have i know it was more of a story than a medicine lecture but i just want to open it up for questions thank you thank you dr jamana that was actually really good that was a really nicely well to get put together history that was really nice and to cover it in 30 minutes that's amazing uh well, i took 40 i guess <laughs> yeah no it's so great i have a question for you um Good. what you know working in fresno county or in fresno um you know we have a very special population here we have a quite a bit underserved population so we see quite sick patients what is what do you think is the most common thing that you see in the pediatric icu here but it's the, like if you if you're asking percentage wise the, the commonest situation that we see is respiratory illnesses out there and it's mainly seasonal especially if it's change of season you see a lot of asthma if it's winter fall and winter season you see a lot of bronchiolitis so if you, the single most important disease condition in terms of numbers would be bronchiolitis and asthma these are the two main things which i which come across in icu most yeah. and in summer in summer you come across a lot of trauma and drownings That's unfortunately true. but we see yeah, yeah. um and at with your time here or if since you've been doing pediatric icu would you mind sharing a case that maybe sticks with you that was like you know had a great outcome at the end of it maybe it was a prolonged stay in the pediatric icu anything you remember you can share sure um without naming names out there this the this is a patient with acute leukemia all acute lymphatic lymphatic leukemia lymphoblastic leukemia out there who essentially had ended up with a bone marrow transplantation and also and picked up an infection when had sepsis septic shock and patients with septic shock and bone marrow transplantations have a very 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 high mortality very high mortality in the sense that they almost at 15 years ago i would i would say it was almost a 90% mortality because a bone marrow transplant and septic shock without ar would develop multi organ dysfunction and everything and eventually we were thinking hard and long whether we should put him on ecmo because ecmo is a relative contraindication in those patient in patients with bone marrow transplant because if they went on ecmo it was almost a death sentence and uh, we decided finally after talking to the family and giving them numbers giving them you know what preparing them for the worst out there we had it was put them put the kid on ecmo and uh, over a period it was it was if i remember that kid stayed in the icu for more than two and a half months it was in the pediatric icu for more than two and a half months but eventually came off ecmo and his the best part his bone marrow transplant worked and is he was cured of his was cured of his leukemia and i i saw him at least about 7 or 8 years after his uh, after this thing and he was he was hale and hearty and healthy and it was we had at many points of time we had offered to the family to do something called what we call we offered to them withdraw support if you if you if that is what you want to stop doing and so that we are not torturing the patient anymore or the patient doesn't have to undergo any suffering we had, we offered it to the family the family were steadfast no we want everything done we want everything done and they were proved right and that is why we said we have to include the family and their wishes in the in the care of the patient and that i remember every time my mind tells me oh the family is perhaps making a wrong decision it i 
I'm reminded of that case all again and again, because I can tell you how many times it was, I can't tell you how many times it was there. And even recently, in the, it was there in MedWatch, if you look at that, okay, we recently had a patient who was in the PICU for a total of one year, who was just discharged from the PICU in March in the community region. And if you YouTube it, you can find it, actually. And it's there on YouTube out there. So it was a, it was a very difficult case too, but there are so many other instances. There are, we can call it small success stories, we can call it, but we also have our failures also, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Krishnan. I think that was really, um, that was, you know, I think those personal stories make it, make medicine special, right? Things that we do that yeah. potentially change somebody's life or something that we, we are part of. And I think it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk today. I really enjoyed it. It seems like everybody in the chat really enjoyed it, learning about the history, and they're very thankful for you giving this talk. We appreciate it. Appreciate <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. And I'd be happy to enjoy it to be part of it in the future too. I would love to spend yeah. time and I would love for it to be in person. That'll be even worse. Uh, nice. It'll be great. Yes, I totally agree. And, um, you know, just for the attendees, I just want to say Dr. Krishna did share some personal stories here. Uh, so make sure that, you know, we do want to make sure that they're not put out there to everybody. It's just for your learning experience and for something you to be aware of. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, I know you guys have a lot of questions in regards to potentially getting into med school and all the classes and what should you be doing pre-med. We'll be answering all of the, most of these questions on our last session. It's going to be a panel with uh, medical students and pre-med students. So just sit tight. You will get your answers at that time for sure. Um, but thank you very much for uh, coming in, joining us today and learning. Sorry that I hadn't had the video on most of the time. This is what I'm dealing with. I don't know if you can see him. He, oh yeah, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, he has been handful since he's been up. I've been running around trying to make sure that, you know, he wait, at least he gets tired so he can go to sleep. So that's what I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> yes, but thank you. <laughs> What's his name, yes. Suki? His name is Jack. What? Jack. Jack? Yep. Nice. Yes, yes. Nice. Yep, yep. Uh, there is a question. I don't know what the context is. It says, pick you versus Valley Children. I don't know what that means. There's PICU in Valley Children's as well, and we have pediatric ICU or CRMC as well. Sorry, Dr. Christian, you uh, Yeah, no. Uh, well, that is what I said. I just mentioned to you there are two, there are two tertiary PICUs in the entire Central Valley. Yep. Between Sacramento and Los Angeles, there are two, PICU, two tertiary level PICUs. One of it is ours, and the second one is at Valley Children's out there. And in Fresno, we are the only one in Fresno County, Valley Children's is in Madeira County. And apart, there is one more pediatric ICU, but that is a community pediatric ICU, which is available at Bakersfield Memorial Hospital down in Bakersfield. So essentially, apart the next PICU, apart from these three, you have to go to either to LA or to Sacramento for the, any other PICU. Yeah. I hope that answers, it was not a clear question, but hope that answers the, whoever had that question out there. All right, I think that's all I see at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Krishna, again. Really all appreciate right. it. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. It was a pleasure, yeah. everyone. Thank you, Samar. Thank you, Sajid. And sure. thank you, Jessica. I think, Dr. Krishna, there's one more question. Oh. Jessica. Yeah. yeah, it's in the, um, the Q&A. Someone was uh, speaking about uh, practicing medicine in the United States, but having a degree from a foreign country and discussing, you know, going to medical school basically in an international with an MBBS degree. And they wanted to see if there was any limitations or was it really difficult or is it actually um, pretty easy if you want to practice in the United States? Uh, it's a very, it's a technically a subjective question, but the fact is if you did your medical schooling outside before you start a residency in the United States, uh, there is a list which does checks the equivalence out there of things there what is recognized in the United States as a, and you, you can get that list easily from ECFMG, what degrees are accepted as equivalent. But the, fortunately for me, at least the medical schooling in India uh, for, was considered 
equivalent to the medical schooling here. So yes, we could just give the two exams, which even US students, graduates have to take, which is the US MLE or in cases of uh, MD students and COMLEX in play, uh, for, I think for DO students at that point of time. And uh, so it was, it was equivalent. So I, I had to take the US MLE when I came to the United States before I started my residency. Okay, and so things do change from time to time. I do know that for as of now, it is not the medicine which is difficult. It is just the system which is different. It is not the, the basics of medicine. The human body remains the same. The heart and the circulatory system and the respiratory system do not change. So if you have learned that, it's, it's perfectly the same. It's only the healthcare system which is different. And then again, then other things come into play there, whether you're, uh, whether you're available seats out there. Right now, I know that for a fact. I used to be a program director at some point, a few years in uh, some part of my career, I used to be that. And uh, at that point, nowadays, the number of residency slots available for foreign medical graduates, what we call them, is getting is less and less because there has been an expansion in the number of medical schools in the United States over the last 10 years. From 2009, 10 onwards, they have grown exponentially. And usually every year used to have a graduate number of around 15,000 medical graduates in the US. Now this number has come up to somewhere around 23 or 20, 22 or 23,000 US medical graduates. So it is what it is. So you, it's a number of, at that point it becomes the number game, I guess. I hope that answers, your, answers the question. Yeah, no, I think, uh, thank you. That was actually very good. Um, there is a person, Medicine Lee, who has her hand up. I not, um, I'm going to allow sure. you to talk. If you have a question, let us know. Sure. Uh, not, not anymore. It just seemed like it, maybe it was up for, uh, by mistake. So I would leave it there. Um, yeah, okay. that's basically yeah, it. There was some question about medical school connections and ties. Mm. Oh. There are some questions there which say, yeah, it's more for medical school. I know. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, I can answer some of these questions just in general. I think Dr. Martin has done a good job answering okay. a lot of questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but uh, in North Carolina Med School, having connections and ties is more prevalent than grades. Um, I, I mean, connections and ties might help, but I think uh, they don't play a huge role from what I can tell at least. Um, I think they do look at overall at the applicant and they determine, you know, you know, look at your grades, look at your experiences. Of course, connection ties maybe help you get more experiences, clinical experiences, that's a possibility. So that's something, that's how it could be helpful. Unless, um, I have never seen it myself, at least through my experience interviewing um, residents here at this residency program, that connection and ties have played a huge role. Um, I've not really seen that. I think it's just the experience and your grades that play a pretty good role. Um, and your interview, that's actually pretty huge. If you get an interview, you really, have to do we are looking at you as a person so if you can connect with you as a person that's very special to us and important to us um, so that's something that we do look at um, but like I said we'll be answering a lot of these questions in our last session um, you will you have a huge panel a panel of few students and myself and hopefully a couple of the residents will be able to answer these questions at that time all right it's a lot of cutie comments for your dog out there Oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. He's very cute. <laughs> he is very cute. I, I'm sure he went to bed. I think he went to his crate now. So hopefully he's not peeing somewhere else. We'll have to find out. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Dr. Christian, for all, yes. all of your excellent words and your amazing presentation. We really appreciate you being here and look forward to having you back in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate that. Have a good day. Everybody. Thanks to everyone who attended today. We appreciate having you as well. We look forward to having you back next week. It should be another exciting week. We're doing a couple of topics. Yeah. Suki, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah. So next week is our, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's the derm and uh, our rheumatology talk. 
So we're going to do, we're going to have a dermatologist come give a talk and we're going to have a rheumatologist from the Valley come give a talk. So I think that would be very interesting. Um, very unique specialties, but they do overlap quite a bit. So I think that'd be fun. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you next week and I will be sure to post this video in, in the email that I sent to you all probably Friday. So look for that there if you want to watch again or share with anyone. And we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Bye-bye.